Uh, so this is my, uh, actually, so these are my financial disclosures uh, and my standard government disclosure. Um, I, uh, these are uh, some books that I will recommend. So this talk is really about um, angiographic anatomy, so uh, anatomy for the uh, neurosurgeon um, who is learning uh, angiography. These are talks, these are books that I recommend. Um, the book that I read when I was a resident was, uh, was Osborne, which is actually a really easy to read book, but uh, it does have some problems with the images uh, and the labels. Um, Pierce Morris is a good book as well about techniques. Uh, and then when you want to look to the Bible for embryologic, embryo embryonic development of certain things, anomalies, et cetera, um, the uh, Berenstein book is good. There's another book by Bradak, B-R-A-D-A-C. So, um, um, somebody emailed me after looking at the, the video of my talk and said, what do you think about this book? Uh, and I went to the book, and actually, it's actually uh, very well illustrated. So the uh, angiograms are actually fairly modern. Uh, and the labels are actually very good, too. I haven't read it cover to cover, so it's full disclosure. I don't know if uh, that would be a, a good entry-level book, but from what I can tell, it's uh, very good. Uh, so um, some basics for, for those of you that don't know some of the, 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 um, the basic uh, physics behind angio, but it's the use of fluoroscopic x-ray. We use iodinated contrast, and we have a lot of uh, modern technology that makes the imaging um, quite good. So with uh, digital subtraction, you get a snapshot um, of the, the soft tissue, the bone, everything, and then digitally subtracted pixel or pixel. And then when you have something live, like uh, in the injection of dye, the dye is the only thing that shows up. And so it makes a very clean uh, picture of just the uh, vasculature. Road mapping uh, does something similar where you actually take just the live superimposed over the subtraction of everything else, and now you actually have a white on dark, which creates a, a roadmap for you to then take your catheter higher or your microwire, microcatheter, microsystem. Um, projections that I'll talk about during this talk, we uh, standard uh, transorbital or frontal um, AP, uh, anterior posterior, more of a towns. Normally, uh, with uh, cranial views, um, uh, the we, we often so say AP, but we're really talking about more of a towns view where you know, you're laying out the vessels since they're all running in a same plane. You want to see them off of each other, so more of a towns view will bring those off. Waters view um, uh, and uh, submental views are things that I'll talk about. So if you're uh, looking for, for instance, for an anterior communicating, you want to look from below to above. Uh, you'll use a submental view. With your lateral tube, the uh, Schuler's view is sometimes uh, uh, you'll see um, on my PCA talk, uh, uh, anatomy of the PCA, you'll see that uh, the Schuler's view is actually useful because there are two parallel vessels with a lateral tube that'll be superimposed. So if you bring the tube off uh, obliquely as such, you'll bring those vessels off of each other. And then now with the ability to do 3D rotational angiography, um, you can actually then manipulate the data uh, after it's acquired. Uh, this acquires usually about 120 um, images, uh, close to 270 degrees of view that are all kind of static uh, views. So that we fill the vessels, and hopefully within the uh, amount of time that we acquire it in the five seconds that you're all catching the arterial phase, uh, and then you take the data, deconvolute it, and then reconstruct it into a, um, a man manipulatable data. That's a picture of a, a 3D RA image. So this is an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, mostly ICA and MCA, but I am going to talk, talk, uh, touch on all of these vessels, uh, as well as uh, anomalies and syndromes that are associated with them. So everyone knows the uh, cervical carotid by, uh, and the carotid bifurcation are really important locations. Um, you guys have all been involved in CEAs. Uh, and uh, so the, knowing the important relationships, uh, basic relationships that the carotid is um, posterior and lateral. And so for angiographic views, we typically will do ipsilateral anterior oblique. So if it's a right ICA they want to look at, um, at least with the AP camera, it's useful to look at it with an RAO view. Uh, so that, as you see in this picture, it uh, splays the uh, ICA it uh, in, uh, accentuates the ICA's um, posterior lateral view or posterior lateral approach uh, relative to the external carotid artery. Um, the bulb is usually the first two centimeters or so of uh, dilatation. It's important to remember that 
for your um, calculations for NASET. So if you have a, a stenosis of the bulb, uh, you have to actually compare it not necessarily to the rest of the bulb, but to the uh, distal normal ICA uh, diameter. Anatomic variance, usually the tonsor loop, this is a very mild tonsor loop, but when the cervical ICA beyond the bulb takes a medial course, uh, sometimes these loops can make two sequential 180 degree loops and uh, they kind of double back on each other. Um, and they're so-called tonsor loops because they sit behind the tonsils and uh, in the early days if somebody saw a pulsatile mass in the tonsils, then they did not think of it being the ICA. They might actually biopsy it and end up getting arterial blood. Not a good thing. So, uh, but that is the, uh, the term for the, the loop that can run very, very medial. Uh, I talked about the bifurcation localization. Um, typically, the bifurcation does um, occur somewhere at the ramus of the mandible, but you can have high, uh, high bifurcations or low bifurcations, and that can affect if, whether or not you decide to do uh, endovascular or an open technique for revascularization. Here's the different segments of the ICA. This is actually a picture is taken from Osborne. Osborne refers to multiple segments, um, which I, I, I did use initially, but I found that it, uh, practical, for practical purposes, um, it really four segments of uh, the ICA is really all that's clinically relevant. You have the uh, cervical petrus, cavernous, and supraclinal. That's a classic teaching. Um, but Osborne does bring it down into um, several other segments where the petrus segment uh, is broken into the petrus and the lacerum segment. So a short segment where the, uh, the carotid is actually passing out of frame and lacerum is its own segment. Um, and then the clinoid is broken down into the clinoid, which is really only the area where the anterior clinoid um, is involved. The ophthalmic, which is the more distal, uh, involving the uh, takeoff of the ophthalmic all the way up to the communicating segment which is the origin of the posterior communicating. But really, um, uh, with relevance to wanting to give a common nomenclature to aneurysms, it's probably more just applicable to know the different types of segment of supraclinoid aneurysms than it is to, to, to bring up the different segments. But going back into the four common segments, the cervical uh, ICA obviously uh, passing up, and uh, as it enters the skull base and becomes a petrous segment, it will actually then take a 90 degree turn anteriorly and run medially in a horizontal segment and then take a vertical uh, turn at which there's a petrolingual ligament uh, shown in this picture, which denotes the separation between the petrous and the uh, cavernous ICA. So that then leads into the first vertical segment of the cavernous ICA, which then becomes the posterior genu, and the posterior genu is relevant uh, angiographically because it tells you where the um, uh, posterior as posterior most aspect of the cavernous sinus, really where Meckel's cave sits. Then it runs in a horizontal segment and then becomes the, um, the siphon, all of which are now continued to be cavernous segments of the ICA. And then only as it passes and gives off the ophthalmic artery, that's the best denotation uh, angiographically of where the uh, beginning of the supraclinoid ICA is. So here's a picture of, um, of an ICA, and you can actually see this is an older angiogram, um, but you actually, if you see the, sure, control the mouse here. What's that? No, I'm trying to uh, use a pointer. Um, so it, the ICA, uh, the cervical ICA is all encased in soft tissue, and the, there's a, usually a subtraction artifact that denotes where the skull base is, and you can also, you, uh, when you look at your native image, you'll know where the, uh, the bone begins. That's the uh, beginning of the petrous segment. There's a, uh, the first vertical segment, then there's a horizontal segment, and it actually looks shorter than it actually is because it's running on this lateral image. It's running more medially. Still continuing as a petrous segment, running vertically and a uh, petrolingual ligament then divides the petrous and the cavernous. Then you have a vertical cavernous and a horizontal cavernous segment, which is connected by what's called the posterior genu, and then it creates the siphon. Do you have any questions up till now? Okay, okay. thanks. Do you have any uh... So angiographically, 
um, people have done many different things to say to to look looking at delayed images to say that, uh, where the dural ring actually sits. Angiographically, really is to take off of the ophthalmic. Um, the the difficult part of that is, as I'll talk about uh, uh, in anatomic variants, is there's a ventral and dorsal ophthalmic. So the ophthalmic originates actually as part of both an ECA, uh, the uh, ACA and ECA, and they, they come together, and wherever they, they end up together is typically where the, uh, the clinoid is. But if you have a ventral origin, it doesn't really mean that the dural ring is below. So for instance, if it actually comes off the, uh, the cavernous segment, you have to actually then use your landmark of the clinoid process itself uh, versus if you have a very dorsal uh, uh, ophthalmic origin which comes off the ACA, uh, you would have to use the same uh, bony landmarks. But angiographically, ophthalmic, you know, 99% of the time is going to tell you where the, the dural ring is. Um, important branches of the um, superclinoid ICA, you guys have all heard the, the mnemonic OPA. Um, and that uh, is ophthalmic, posterior communicating, and anterior choroidal. Um, they uh, are, are the initial branches initially off of the uh, superclinoid ICA. There is actually a, uh, other smaller branches, superior hypophyseal, um, but angiographically, you typically only see the posterior communicating and the anterior choroidal. The, um, Posterior communicating usually originates af, uh, from this uh, posterior genu of the supraclinoid ICA as it starts to run more superiorly, and then the anterior choroidal uh, will run more off that uh, vertical segment. It tends, when you're looking at the AP view, um, the, it tends that the anterior choroidal will actually uh, run straight first and then run into a more lateral course as it actually heads towards the um, choroidal fissure in the temporal lobe. <clears throat> Some anatomic variants to be aware of. If you're doing a lateral view of your ICA and you see that the ICA <clears throat> is a lot more posterior than that, that view that I showed you, that's uh, typically, or it's a very, uh, it's fairly uncommon occurrence, but that's what's called the aberrant ICA. And the aberrant ICA is a, um, uh, can be confirmed if you look at your CT scan, your temporal bones, uh, temporal bone CT, you'll see that the uh, carotid canal is not in a normal location. And the aberrant ICA originates because embryologically the same embryonic uh, origins of the ECA and the ICA are the same. And the uh, inferior tympanic branch of the uh, uh, ascending pharyngeal, which uh, in normal people regresses and becomes very small, does not regress. And it connects to the, in the intracranial portion of the ICA uh, with the carotid tympanic branch. And it continues. So it runs actually very close to the inner ear. Uh, and that's how that, the, uh, pers the uh, aberrant ICA um, uh, originates. The carotid, so those are actually important because that's still a very important anastomotic channel between the ICA and the ECA in, in people that have normal ICA and ECA anatomy. So the carotid tympanic branch uh, is one of the few branches that actually comes off the petrous ICA that can be involved in, uh, in uh, ICEC IC uh, anastomosis. The persistence of the pedial artery in certain people, with, uh, and this can also be confirmed by CT temporal bone, uh, windows is that there's actually no foramen spinosum because there's no normal uh, generation of the middle meningeal artery. And the middle meningeal artery instead comes off of the ICA, uh, and um, uh, that's uh, and that also runs very close into uh, in behind the uh, stapedius. So the stapedial artery itself is what gives rise off the ICA uh, to the middle, supply of the middle meningeal territory. Persistent arteries, you guys have all heard of, uh, most commonly the um, persistent trigeminal artery, the PTA. Persistent trigeminal artery, these are, uh, again, embryonic rendiments where there's a connection between the anterior and posterior that have not uh, evolved into the communicating arteries. And when they don't regress, they uh, create a persistent anterior and posterior communication. Uh, really, the most important of which, and, and these are all associated with higher rates of um, uh, vascular anomalies and aneurysms and such. But they're also important when you're doing, for instance, a WADA, uh, WADA test. Uh, the reason we want to look at the anatomy is to make sure we don't have these dangerous connections through which the, um, the amatol might actually uh, falsely um, uh, affect the test. So it may affect how, in, how fast you inject your amatol. So the persistent trigeminal artery typically originates with, uh, the, from the anterior side from the cavernous segment. So you really shouldn't have, 
any large cavernous vessels. So when you look at this, this might look like a poster communicating, but when you actually look at it closely, you realize that that uh, vessel is originating from the posterior genu, which as I told you, was a cavernous vessel, um, a cavernous segment of the ICA, and thus really actually shouldn't be giving rise to any sort of communicating arteries. And these posterior, uh, these persistent trigeminal arteries can actually communicate with any segment along the vertebral basilar system. So they can actually go directly into the PCA. They can go into the trunk. Commonly, they're in the, into the trunk of the basilar, but I've also seen them uh, directly connect into aicas with really no other connection to the vertebral basilar. So some common disorders, obviously, the aneurysms. So aneurysms, when they get large enough, they can produce mass effect. Um, and I'll really kind of go over the syndromes based on really uh, uh, their segments. So in this, uh, you know, petrous ICAs, they can erode the bone. Uh, petrous aneurysms can get very large before they actually even become very symptomatic. And sometimes they may not be symptomatic at all, in which case the argument is, well, why, why would we treat them? Because we know that they're extracranial. Um, but they tend to get treated just because they end up getting very large and we really don't know what to do with those. Um, cavernous aneurysms, I'll talk about uh, them, D depending on the, the, how they grow, where along the cavernous segment they are, they can produce a cavernous sinus syndrome, um, and I'll get into that. So other aneurysms that are named um, uh, by segment the, uh, along the supraclinal ICA, so aneurysms that originate at the level of the ophthalmic um, are really periclinoid aneurysms, but when they point medially and inferiorly, they are, uh, I, I term those carotid cave aneurysms. Um, and when Roton did um, exposure of the carotid cave, some of those were actually dural, some of those were uh, super, uh, in the subarachnoid space, and some of those were actually superior hypophyseal. So the carotid cave as a space, even though we named the aneurysm carotid cave aneurysm, uh, it can actually be a mishmash of different aneurysms. I tend to treat them because you really don't know unless there's some some technology in the future where you can really prove where the dural ring is, um, there is a chance that that's in the subarachnoid space. Um, here's a little view of a lateral, a more uh, a lateral view of a, an aneurysm that's pointing down. But if you notice it, it's actually taking off more distal to the ophthalmic. So this actually would not be termed a carotid cave. This is usually a segment of which the superior apophyseal comes, arises. Uh, here's another picture of a superior hypophyseal. Um, here's a picture of what might actually be termed a carotid cave if you knew where the ophthalmic was uh, taking off. But again, because it points medially, uh, I'd argue that it's probably very close to that carotid cave space. Uh, here's a picture of multiple aneurysms, one originating from the cavernous segment, one actually originating from the supraclinoid distal to the ophthalmic. I tend to call those paraophthalmics because they actually will also uh, traditionally point laterally as opposed to straight up or originate uh, from the level of where the ophthalmic originates. Uh, and then there's the posterior communicating, which is uh, useful, again, to identify where the anterior choroidal is. Uh, in this person, there's no actual posterior communicating vessel itself, so, but yet it's still called a communicating aneurysm. Uh, and you can see distal to that where the small anterior choroidal arises. Uh, posterior communicating aneurysms can also be a stem aneurysms from the posterior communicating themselves, which, which sometimes make them more difficult to treat, even though this is a narrow-necked aneurysm. This is a fetal origin PCA. There's no washout of the PCA, so we know that there's no P1 segment on that ipsilateral side, so not a complete circle of Willis. But the aneurysm doesn't actually originate from the segment of the supraclinoid ICA. It originates from the stem of the aneurysm, yet we would still call this a posterior communicating aneurysm. Uh, here's a MRA view of an aneurysm that originates from both the posterior communicating and uh, anterior choroidal, two separate aneurysms. Um, and the, those are the, the OPAs that I will talk about. I'm not going to talk too much about the fistulas, but uh, there is a common disorder from the uh, cavernous segment. If you had a cavernous aneurysm, uh, again, <clears throat> unless they're large and they cause cavernous sinus syndrome, we typically don't treat them. However, uh, the, if they rupture, they could actually cause a direct rent. And trauma is the other way that you can have a direct rent from the cavernous segment of the ICA directly to the cavernous sinus. So the, the clinical history is very important. If, if the clinical history is missing from trauma, you're most likely talking about an indirect fistula. And that indirect fistula is really uh, just like any other dural fistula, but it's just, it's just originating or the, the site of the fistulization is actually in the cavernous sinus, the dura of the cavernous sinus itself. 
So in those situations, the ICA still can be contributing to the fistula. It's just doing it through indirectly through these tiny uh, supply, the vascular supply, from the infralateral trunk and the meningohypophyseal trunk, those two small, two small branches that are typically not seen in angiogram, which then give rise to the, uh, the blood supply of the dura. And that can be confirmed by doing an external run where all the blood supply is predominantly coming from. So I mentioned the cavernous sinus syndrome. So large cavernous sinus aneurysms, particularly when they're put pointing laterally, uh, as you remember, all the cranial nerves that run through the cavernous sinus, you can have multiple uh, ocular motility problems, um, facial pain or facial uh, numbness uh, because of the nerves that actually run through there. And that would be an indication for treating a large cavernous aneurysm. Ophthalmic aneurysms such as this um, can often uh, produce uh, optic neuropathy. So the optic nerves in the uh, are obviously going to be draped uh, uh, over these, and as they stretch, they can cre create a, a neuropractic injury, um, sometimes of which cannot be recoverable. Anterior communicatings can do, uh, do similar, uh, cause similar problems. Anterior choroidals are interesting. They're not common aneurysms, uh, but when they do rupture, they can sometimes present with uh, isolated ventricular bleeding. Um, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned in the anatomy part of it, the uh, anterior choroidal does, does do a lot of parenchymal supply. It supplies the, the hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, and capsule, as you guys know. Um, but it's called the choroidal anterior choroidal because it's really predominantly the only supply for the, um, the choroid in the uh, anterior temporal lobe uh, in the ventricle. So it makes, it makes a dive laterally uh, on AP views. Uh, enters a choroidal fissure, supplies uh, the, um, uh, the choroid in the uh, temporal horn. So it has a direct pathway if it ruptures to, to cause uh, ventricular bleeding uh, isolated to which presents in one side as opposed to kind of a diffuse intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, if uh, as a complication of uh, some sort of endovascular open therapy and you have an, uh, infarction that are clear um, clearly defined anterior choroidal syndromes, uh, obviously pure motor because you're taking out all the capsule, but you actually have um, hippocampal injury, which, as we talked about, and uh, uh, classically described anterior choroidal infarcts uh, include sector anopsias uh, because it does supply the epithalamus, the lateral geniculate body. Uh, and then there's an the image of, of what an anterior choroidal can, uh, infarct can do. Posterior communicating uh, aneurysms, classically, we, we like to talk about the third nerve palsy. Again, uh, if they get large and or if they rupture, uh, one of the first things they may present with is that they have parasympathetic uh, paresis as opposed to complete ocular, extraocular motor palsy. And the reason for that is, as you know, the parasympathetics run on the outside. And so the first thing to be compromised is the parasympathetic. And you may not actually have third nerve um, compromise uh, in the beginning. Uh, infarction, uh, poster communicating is even, you know, theoretically, if you have a P1 segment, then you shouldn't have any problems. However, the poster communicating does give rise to a lot of thalamal perforators. Uh, so if you have a high resolution angiogram and you can see the posterior communicating, sometimes you'll see tiny little perforators that are supplying the ventral and the anterior aspect of the thalamus. Uh, if you occlude the posterior communicating, hopefully you're not causing thrombus within the whole posterior communicating, and then you would actually have blood supply from the, uh, the posterior circulation uh, taking over for the thalamus. Some odd oddball aneurysms um, that we might name. Um, any aneurysm along the um, basilar trunk there we call basilar, uh, basilar trunk aneurysms up until the SCA. And then if something originates from the SCA in the short segment of the basilar at the basilar quadrification between the SCA and the P1 segment, those are termed SCA aneurysms. Aneurysms can arise eccentrically off the basilar tip, so they're no longer really basilar tip aneurysms. If they really originate off of one of those PCA segments, either the P1 or P2 segment, uh, they are so named PCA segments by, by the segment of which they're uh, originating. And the ICA terminus has a, f a fairly interesting um, uh, way of presenting as well because, as you remember, here's a, here's a base of the uh, brain view. The, the whole, the, the term anterior perforated substance, which is actually the ventral ganglia, uh, is the anterior perforated substance because of the lenticular striates, they actually have to perforate through that substance. So that is actually where the ICA terminus lies. 
the ICA terminus gives off the medial and lateral lenticular striates. And you can have an aneurysm if it grows, if it grows superiorly, uh, they can actually present with ganglionic dysfunction. So there may actually be a hemi-Parkinsonism or some sort of hemi-tremor. And that may be the, uh, the reason that the ICA terminus aneurysm is discovered in the first place. Um, I'm going to have to breeze through. I'm running behind. I apologize. Uh, segments of the uh, uh, ACA, the best view for the first segment of the ACA is really your frontal or your town's view. As you see, the A1 is running anteriorly and medially, and that's where you can actually capture most of the views of the A1. Beyond that, if you look um, laterally, you can see the A1 is really superimposed on itself because it's, it's really running very medially there. But then when it runs superiorly, um, under the, uh, the, uh, the callosum, it actually is running uh, uh, in the best view to see on the lateral view. A2, then it actually takes a turn around the, the uh, genu of the corpus callosum and then becomes all the cortical branches. So A1 and A2 are distinguished between both their, their directions as well as where they are located relative to the communicating, uh, anterior communicating artery, which is the, the, the point at which the A1 bends into the A2. Uh, the cortical branches, uh, as it courses over, there's usually a, a uh, frontal polar branch, which is usually at the point of which the, uh, uh, it's cor uh, coursing over the genu. And that frontal polar branch gives off a uh, rise to several medial branches, medial frontal branches, anterior, middle, and posterior. And, and as it does so, it has a, a appearance of a candelabra, so it's often, often termed the medial candelabra branches. Inferiorly, it'll actually give rise to the orbital frontal branch as a variable branch. Uh, and then as it terminates, there's a, some variability into a pericolosal and colosal marginal. The pericolosal will actually hug the colosum in the cingulate sulcus, terminate into the posterior, um, excuse me, the anterior splenial artery, which has a collateral zone with the posterior splenial artery, which arises from the PCAs. Um, and that's a good uh, watershed zone as well as a good collateral zone if the ACA is occluded uh, in, in disease states such as moya moya. Colosal marginal will actually run more uh, uh, in its own sulcus uh, all the way up to the cortex, uh, supply the precuneus, so it actually terminates in the parietal lobe. Some other branches, um, medial lenticular striates we, uh, uh, we talked about, that's, that's variable. A lot of times the M1 segment will actually supply the majority of the medial lenticular striates, so there's variability there. Uh, we talked about the colosal arteries, the splenial arteries we talked about. Ag Azagus ACA, you may actually hear that term. There Sometimes it's a misnomer if somebody has a really large A1 on one side and no in a hypoplastic or aplastic A1 on the other side. The The... Traditional description for azagus is actually that A1 is a large trunk that never really has a communicating segment. So it stays a solid A1 until it bifurcates somewhere more distally. The azagus ACA is associated with, uh, with aneurysms um, and other vascular anomalies. Recurrent artery Hubner is often talked about. Um, it is a variable artery, and it does originate from the A2. But as the A2 is running superiorly, as I told you, uh, there is, if you see a small branch that runs uh, laterally and posteriorly, that is the recurrent artery humor. Um, fairly important uh, supplying to both the head, head of the caudate, and here's a view of that. Uh, so again, post A1 originating fairly close to where the communicating is coming off, and then that vessel runs posteriorly. So it can supply both the head of the caudate and the genu of the, of the internal capsule. And it can give rise to a syndrome if somebody has an ACA that's occluded and they have a, a significant recurrent artery of Huebner, you would have infarct of the genu, which is the uh, cortical bulbar fiber, so you actually have facial weakness. And then cortically, you have weakness of the leg. So you have face and leg weakness sparing the arm. Um, and that's a, um, a syndrome that's often talked about. Segments of the MCA, this is really where I really want to focus. Um, M1, 2, 3, and 4, also termed uh, sphenoidal, insular, opercular, and uh, cortical branches. The uh, sphenoidal is a horizontal lateral approach or lateral segment, initial segment of the M1. Not a whole lot of cortical branches coming off of that. Uh, the, the key vessels are the lenticular strites that come off the superior and posterior aspect of it. On occasion, you'll have an anterior temporal branch, which give, uh, originates inferiorly and points anteriorly. But there's a lot of variability to what that anterior temporal can supply. So if it supplies just the temporal tip, it's called the temporal polar. Uh, you want to be a little bit more specific. Sometimes those vessels, that anterior temporal, can actually just wrap around the temporal lobe and then give rise to 
supply of the of the posterior temporal lobe. So even though it arises anteriorly, it's really not giving rise to the anterior temporal lobe. Um, best view for that is that AP view. It's running horizontal. Here's a, a good illustration there of all those lenticular striates that are coming off posteriorly and then running up and supplying the, the lenticular nucleus. Uh, as it, term, it comes out and enters uh, the, the beginning of the cilian fissure, it becomes the insular branch. So these insular segments are now all called M2s, and that's usually where the bifurcation, trifurcation of the MCA occurs. All of those M2s, as they're running and hugging the insula, they're giving perforators to the insula. So the main supply of the insula is actually the M2s themselves. Um, they'll run up, and on this uh, AP view, you'll see they all, they all terminate uh, their M2 segment and then run horizontally. And they're doing that because they're hitting the roof of the operculum, and now they're becoming opercular segments coming out of Sylvian Fisher, and then as they come out onto the, the convexity, then they become the named cortical branches. And uh, a couple branches and variants. Uh, accessory uh, MCA uh, is when the AC, uh, an M1 branch, or usually a, a cortical branch, uh, of the MCA comes off the ICA terminus itself, inferior to the M1 stem, uh, versus an excess uh, for a duplicated uh, M1 where the uh, MCA branch comes off the A1 segment and recurs backwards and then tends to run along the M1. So you actually on CTA you might actually see two parallel vessels running where the M1 would be. The um, I'm going to end on this picture. Uh, the uh, lateral view uh, is much more complex uh, to learn, but the way to start is to actually identify that there is a pattern to how all these MCA vessels are, um, are making their turns. So this, I selected this angiogram because the, um, the ACAs are actually kind of washed out. There's predominantly flow from the contralateral ACA, so you're really looking at good MCA branches here. So the, as you can tell, the branches on the more anterior side don't have a, a there's not a, a kind of uniform pattern of where the vessels are, are turning. However, back here, they're all coming up, and if you imagine a line here, they're all coming up and hitting something and coming back down, right? So this is actually the inside of the Sylvian fissure, the front, uh, the, the, the top of the operculum, which is where the M2, the insert segment, is then becoming the opercular segment. So the Sylvian triangle is, as, if, as you guys have done dissections of the, of the, the Sylvian fissure, it's actually larger, the Sylvian fissure is larger anterior than it is posterior. So as it gets closer to become the angular gyrus, where the termination of the Sylvian fissure is, that's where the least curvature is. So as in this case, the vessel is insular. Uh, let's just take this angular branch. So you have the insular segment in M2 coming, hitting the roots of the Sylvian fissure, become the opercular branch, coming out and then eventually poking out of the end of the Sylvian fissure. So this triangle identifies uh, uh, is, is the identification of the insula itself inside the sylvian fissure. And then as, as you can identify the tail of that isosceles triangle, the vessel that comes out of that is commonly called the, called the angular branch. And the angular branch runs over the angular gyrus. And I usually typically count uh, vessels from posterior to anterior after I identify the angular, angular artery. Um, usually one to two centimeters. Uh, you're talking about every sulcus uh, there's going to be another vessel running through, so the posterior parietal, anterior parietal, and then the um, post-tensional sulcus, which is going to supply, anteriorly, it's going to supply the primary sensory co cortex, posteriorly, the, um, the, post, uh, the secondary somatosensory cortex, and then the Rolandic or central artery, and that central artery runs, uh, supplies anteriorly the motor strip, posteriorly the sensory cortex, um, and then the um, precentral and then uh, prefrontal branches. Anterior to the Sylvian fissure, um, the vessels that are running really over the frontal lobe, uh, the prefrontal lobe, and some of the frontal operculum, I typically call just the opercular branches, and they typically have a, a candelabra as well, uh, where there's a medial, uh, uh, excuse me, a middle, uh, anterior, middle, and a posterior, and those uh, would be the lateral candelabra. But that's really supplying the, supplying the frontal eye fields and the frontal operculum there.